Welcome to a Fort Knox update. I am here with Tom Siebel, the CEO of C3 AI and Nikhil Krishnan, uh, CTO, uh, I believe. I get that right, Nikhil? That's correct. That's correct. Right. Um, and so some news here about um, the availability of generative AI uh, delivered to your customers on top of C3's platform. Um, I don't know, Tom, you want to just give me the overview of uh, what this means? Yeah, this was really motivated by work that we're doing for Department of Defense. And I got a text some months ago uh, on a project that we're working on from someone in authority there. And it said, Tom, what we really need is Google for DOD. And I responded, let me give this some thought. The next time I'm out, I'll, I'll show it to you. So then Nikhil and I and some others got together and thought, what does that mean in Google for DOD? And um, in terms of a human interface model. And what I thought about it was, well, there's really one computer human interfa interface that everybody knows how to use, okay? Our kids know how to use it. The CEO knows how to use it. The chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff knows how to use it. The colonel on the flight line at, at Wright Pat knows how to use it. Um, everybody knows how to use the Google AI, uh, UI. So what we thought about is the opportunity and what we engineered is the opportunity to combine basically a Google-like UI with a search bar. And the search bar certainly precedes Google. I mean, it goes back to Yahoo and Ask Jeeves and, and AltaVista. And this is not a new idea. Um, uh, natural language, natural language processing, generative AI, and then reinforcement learning that allows us a very uh, innovative way to um, interact with an application. I imagine that there are some things um, that DOD, that the intelligence community would want to do that they don't want the whole world to see just by nature, right? So how does this run? Where does this run? so that uh, security is taken care of? Um, so we've, we've designed this uh, application so it can be deployed in air-gapped uh, environments, in very secure environments. Uh, so the entire application can be shipped over to a DoD environment uh, and then applied and you know, retrained against DoD data sets um, and, then, uh, and then serve up the enterprise generated search function uh, respecting all of their access controls, their um, uh, their authorizations, their their security clearance requirements, etc. Um, so it's it's all designed to be completely portable. So this is exactly a scenario that I was trying to ask a chip CEO about um, just a, a few weeks ago, where I imagine one of the best potential uses of something like Chat GPT is. Uh, you're in intelligence and you're trying to take a whole bunch of data about who might be living at a certain can location I guess, can I guess and, and figure out, um, is this it. really yeah. who we're looking for? Uh, and you can ask it questions in a natural language way to figure that out. Is this in effect what you'd be able to deliver with this as sort of like an, an air gapped kind of custom trained AI that's able to answer questions based on, you know, thousands, millions of data points uh, and sift through that? Um, th that's exactly the idea. So we, we, we could take uh, this uh, AI application, deploy it in a secure enclave. Uh, it would then retrain based on the corpus of data available to it. Um, and then it would help answer, uh, retrieve questions, retrieve information, summarize answers, and basically help analysts um, uh, and, uh, and other professionals get to the information that they're looking for in a very quick and direct way. So that, uh, that uh, what you described is exactly um, the objective. So, uh, Nikhil, tell me, how does this get smarter, right? The training part is going to be important. So if it doesn't, if it's air gapped and it's, you know, protected, that's great. How does it get smarter so it continues to um, not only deliver the specialized intelligence necessary to answer very detailed and secretive questions, but also generally smarter to understand human language uh, so that it's it's efficient enough that way. Um, so in, in terms of the the basic understanding of human language, we're building on a lot of foundational models that that others have worked on and that 
uh, academics, uh, Google, et cetera, have worked on. And we're leveraging all of that innovation. When we deploy these models, uh, and we, we, do, um, we do work uh, uh, on our end, but when we deploy them in customer environments, we also instrument the application so that uh, we're able to collect feedback from users. We're able to understand what users are actually clicking on, what they're doing. So the entire system is a learning system, and it gets smarter in that secure environment over time. Um, and then as we have uh, innovations in the foundational capabilities, we deploy newer versions to secure environments or to isolated environments or to just our customer cloud environments uh, in order for those models to then uh, get the latest and greatest and become smarter over time. So it sounds like it's working on at least two tracks, the custom track for the customer itself, for the things that they need to be protected, a general track where it's just getting smarter about um, being human-like conversational and being C3AI, I imagine there might also be an industry-specific track where for you know, military uses, for intelligence uses, there might be certain platform-based uh, enhancements that might go out. Oh, well, uh, we're on one. Uh, so we uh, at C3, we really focus. C3 AI, we really focus on the enterprise, uh, and we're on one global code base for our for our for the software work that we do, including the C3 generative AI stack. Uh, and then the approach is that from that code base, we deploy um, uh, to our customer environments, uh, and then those individual units that are deployed into our customer environments also are self-learning over time. Um, so it's 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 kind of one global code base that continuously improves. Uh, and then we branch off from that and deploy into our customer environments, if that makes sense. That does make sense. I, I know that you also have some industry specific applications. So that's where I was trying to go with that and whether there are, there's also an industry specific track uh, wh where this is improving over time. But is it, mo is it the general code base? Tom, you wanna jump in here and, uh, and, and then uh, just the individual customer? John, this is applicable across all of our customers, all of our verticals and all of our applications. And while we originally developed this uh, at the request of the Department of Defense, uh, US Department of Defense, uh, I'm in the UK right now dealing with National Institutes of Health. And I can, I can show you a use case where we're using it in a precision health application. But we'll use this for stochastic optimization of the supply chain, demand forecasting, fraud detection. Virtually all of our customers will be using this uh, after this goes into general availability in March. Let me ask Nikhil, uh, just to, and I'll mute you for a second, Tom. Um, let me ask about something specific, uh, OpenAI, ChatGPT. It's not the only um, generative uh, AI option out there, but it certainly is getting a lot of attention. Does this allow customers to work off of a menu of... Uh, a whole lot of different potential ways, uh, flavors uh, of AI to, to layer on, on top here? Uh, th th that's a really good question. Uh, we, we've actually, um, we've ex experimented and prototyped with many of the uh, generative AI algorithms. Um, uh, our thought process is for this first search capability, uh, we will curate the actual um, algorithms uh, underneath uh, um, the hood, if you will, um, in terms of both the language models and all of the secondary algorithms that are built into our stack. Uh, and then over time, we, we have a product roadmap that's, um, uh, that's quite robust where we imagine this branches out into many different products over time. For example, a, a data generation product, a data labeling product, products for developers, products for the enterprise. Um, and then uh, over time, we imagine a menu of, uh, of these large language models, interactive generated models being offered um, so our customers and our our, uh, our customers who are developers or data scientists will be able, will be able to take advantage of that and extend that. So then, how do customers pay for that, and how do you charge for it? Is it sort of like um, there's a markup and, and they're ordering off of a menu? Uh, does it work similar to uh, how a lot of these cloud platforms work now, where there's sort of applications living uh, in the, in the platform that you can activate? You know, the honest answer is, John, you know, right now we're making this available as part of our product to all of our customers, uh, all of our C3 customers. And this will be kind of a standard part of the of the user interface. This, this is the this is the new the new human uh, human computer interaction model for all of our enterprise AI applications. And how do you expect that to develop over time? I mean, um, open AI, 
Microsoft certainly expect to make some money off of what they're doing. So I imagine, you know, various companies as their um, as their uh, large language models get proven and perhaps, you know, hopefully there's demand for them. Um, they're going to want to pass through those charges. How do you expect that to develop? Well, I think that, uh, um, you know, these things look, I'm quite certain that these models, that these large language models are going to be continue to be available, you know, as open source solutions. And uh, so from Google, from Microsoft, from OpenAI, and, um, you know, it, um, uh, so I don't anticipate there'll be any cost to us to use the large language models. You'll see that this is a user interface that the CEO of a hospital can use, a physician can use, a patient can use. Okay, somebody in the flight line can use it. Uh, a uh, the, the chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff could use. Uh, you could use. I could use. And we simply ask it a question. And so. So what happens is you go into the, the window and you type the question, for example, well, I might want to know, you know, what my gaps in radar coverage are in a paycom, or I might want to know what my waiting list is in a hospital for a certain type of surgery. I want to know what my, uh, what my uh, emergency bed utilization rates are. And just like Google, it'll give you a number of alternatives for the questions it'll come up with an AI inferred answer right below there. It'll, it'll then on the right, write a detailed screen about how many hospital beds you have, where they're located, what your utilization rates are today. And then it will provide all of the other sources of information within the hospital system where there are data relevant to this. It might be a schematic of the, of the hospital if we're dealing with predictive maintenance for the B1 bomber. For example, it might be the maintenance manual for the B-1 bomber. It might be a Palantir application that shows the state of readiness. It might be an Excel spreadsheet that shows the budget for the B-1 bomber. It might be the pilot's operating handbook. It might be the FARs or DFARs that show the, you know, the regulations for flying. And these informations are in text files, in enterprise applications, in PDFs, in Excel spreadsheets, in C3, in, in, in Oracle ERP systems, wherever the data reside within the enterprise, we have used the large language model to kind of gather these and make them instantly available to the general, to the CEO, to the private, to the person working on the factory line at, 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 in the production uh, field at, at Shell or in the, the paper plant at Georgia Pacific. And it's it, it, in, as you uh, see from the demo, it, it's really quite remarkable and it fundamentally changes the nature of the human computer interaction model as it relates to enterprise applications. So is there any need to shift the design of security um, with this, the availability of this kind of application? I mean, naturally, I imagine it exists when whomever logs in, right? They have a certain level of clearance to get delivered a certain level of answer. But um, th the private doesn't have the same, shouldn't have the same access as the general. So based on the type of question, is the AI going to go, well, maybe, maybe you shouldn't know that. No, it, it, we have a very, very rigid access controls. Okay, we have logging, we have audit trails, but based upon what you see is based upon who you are. Okay, so if you're the chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, you will see everything. If you are the commander at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, you'll see what's at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. If you're in charge of the F-35 squadron at Wright-Pat, you'll see the information related to the F-35. Okay, and if you're the, you know, the maintenance technician in the, you know, for the F-35 program at Wright-Pat, okay, you'll only see the information related to maintenance for the aircraft that you're allowed to maintain. So all the access controls, all the security levels are very firmly enforced. As are we have, we're enforcing encryption motion, encryption at rest, okay, very high levels of security. There's no, you know, this, this, is, this is running in, you know, 
very secure DOD environments, very secure banking environments, very secure grid environments where we're, where we're dealing with critical infrastructure. So security is assured, data are encrypted, encrypted in motion, encrypted in rest, and access controls are rigidly enforced. All right, uh, interesting stuff to see this start to get real application um, in the real world where it's most needed. Uh, Tom, Nikhil, thanks for joining me on a Fort Knox update. Thanks, thanks John. Thank you.